capacity of the store. We've been here 152 years. I think we're 65th and Lex. And then at the end, uh, we'll have questions. And anything, again, yeah, whatever you want to know, anything we talk about Catholic topics, uh, morality, politics, whatever you want, any question you want, no problem. Uh, and anything is open. And uh, so, okay, grew up in New Jersey, and this is my uh, mother, my sisters, and, and Sheila. My mother actually grew up in Washington Heights, Helen. My father grew up uh, in Morningside Heights, and all of my grandparents were Irish immigrants. As you tell us, a little thinner here, I think this was before the introduction of high fructose corn syrup with the American diet. Uh, and unfortunately, I've been suffering from that ever since. Uh, high fructose corn syrup. That's the obesity issues we're going. You, you guys have somebody in on obesity and vegetables. That'll be a good topic sometime. Um, but anyway, we can advance to the next slide. So I went to uh, I, grew, I went to Emerson College in Boston. Great communication school. Henry Winkler uh, graduated from there. Uh, let's see, Norman Lear graduated from there. Uh, so it's a great school for television, film, and radio. And I guess it was about, uh, so I grew up in a Catholic home, Catholic household, went to Catholic grammar school, Catholic high school in New Jersey. It was taught by some sisters out of the greater Philadelphia area, called the Immaculate Heart Mary Sisters. Uh, but then I would say my mother and father's were not baby boomers. My mother's 80, my father died uh, nine years ago at the age of 73 of Parkinson's. And my parents were part of, uh, maybe what some of you were part of, the silent generation. So you were born during the Depression, so too young for World War II, or too old for uh, Korea or Vietnam, per se. I'm not thinking of military terms as far as service. But you think about it, um, my parents weren't baby boomers. So uh, my parents weren't part of the greatest generation, you know, fought the war. So that being said, I grew up in a house where you know, we didn't have a lot of rock and roll. My parents met at an Irish dance in the basement of Cathedral High School on 51st and 1st Avenue in 1966. Uh, you know, they got married in 1967, up at the Incarnation, uh, up on 175th and St. Nicholas, and then they moved out to Jersey in 69. My mother's still out there today. So I'm the youngest of three, that's my sister Eileen, and I think she wanted the drama degree uh, when we took that photo on graduation day. My sister Sheila, my father, he got uh, his, his cap, he actually didn't, he got accepted to Florida, but he didn't finish. And uh, so he got his little graduation cap, and my mother Helen there, my sister Eileen, and my sister Sheila. So that was June of 1994. And uh, earlier, I'd say in the fall of 1987, uh, so we never had a lot of rock and roll in the house. My parents weren't like into the Beatles and Chuck Berry and Elvis, and they didn't do the Bobby Sox thing in 1950 with the soda fountains and the big Fords or anything. My parents loved Irish music. So uh, I got turned on and I got bit by the rock and roll bug. So if you want to click to the next slide, um, let's see here. Let me take a quick peek at that. Uh, okay, so I got bit by the rock and roll bug, and uh, in late the late 1980s, early 90s, I got uh, turned on to a lot of the music from the, the baby boomer generation, especially there's a group out of the San Francisco hippie group, the Grateful Dead. I started to listen to them a lot and enjoy their music. My sister uh, brought some of their music home from college in the late 80s. And uh, then I found, just surfing on the radio dial, uh, local community radio that was playing live Grateful Dead music. And I was like, oh, this is pretty neat. This is around 1989, 1990. And I befriended the disc jockey up at this station called WNTI. There's the uh, call letters, uh, 91.9 FM. It's out of Hackettstown, New Jersey, which is near the Delaware Water Gap. If anybody goes out to the Poconos on Route 8 right there. And also, it's now called Centenary University. Uh, it was called Centenary College. Uh, I think a couple of their claims to fame are they have one of the best equine programs in the country, fair to horses. And also, two, uh, Placido Domingo's daughter went there. And actually, the, that singer from the Lower East Side, uh, Blondie, Debbie Harris, she. Uh, she went to Centenary College. So I befriended the disc jockeys as a, let's see, I was 13 or 14. And uh, I, we, 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 we'd trade music tapes and I would go visit them in the studios. And then around June of, uh, summer of 1993, I approached the general manager of the radio station. And I said, could I help out for the summer? Could I change trashes, maybe arrange the albums and the CDs? And he said, well, listen, I've got holes in the schedule to fill because I've got students that have gone away for the summer. So he said, would you like to have two hours on the radio every Tuesday? And of course, I said, yes, I have my driver's license so I can drive. So I continued in the broadcast tradition of these DJs 
that I had befriended. So we had an hour of kind of like new music, there'll be an hour of, of live Grateful Dead concerts. And uh, then I would study and give little tidbits and little information, you know, and try to turn people on to new music. And I took to it pretty quickly. So that was summer of 1993. Now my senior year was hitting. Uh, and I asked Sister Mary Brister, our college principal, uh, high school principal, if I could continue to do the radio show on Tuesday afternoons and leave school early. And the general manager had agreed to move my shift up to, I think, three to five or maybe four to six. And she said, if you keep your grades up and you get the permission from the sister, Sister Michelle, that's her soul, if she gives you permission to leave her your last class early, I'll allow it. So it began, and I was leaving early on Tuesdays, my senior year, to continue to do the radio show. Now, this picture was taken after my senior year. I mean, wait, this was taken maybe 10, 12 years ago, after college, because I did stay affiliated with the station until um, I left for the Dominican Order. So we move over to the next slide. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the great friend and Bob Dylan uh, when they did a tour together in 1987, so I want to have a little image of the great friend in. Uh, so then I uh, got accepted to Emerson College in Boston, as you saw in the photo earlier, because I found a school and they had a great radio program. I knew that's where I wanted to go. And my four years in Boston uh, was, was very, very good. Uh, Emerson allowed the students to get involved right away with radio, television, or film. Uh, it gave top-level broadcast experience. Um, you were in a dynamic city. Although it's funny, after four years in Boston, coming from the New York metro area, of course, Jersey, Boston felt like a village. And I was ready to go home. I didn't want to stay in Boston. It was too small. They had to come. Once you're from New York, as we say, the city, everything else just is well. <laughs> now, I've never been to Tokyo. I've never been to Moscow. I've never been to Paris. But, uh, you know, nothing else is like New York. So I came home, and I got involved uh, with a small music production company town. Gentlemen had started up a little independent record label, a little studio, a storefront studio, kind of like the way Motown and uh, some of the southern record labels like Stack Records and things, they had these little studios and storefronts way back, uh, Chess Records in Chicago, and then they worked with the local artists, and that's what we did. Well, you know, I've never really thought of it that way. And I moved, and like, uh, now I'm not a millennial, but as a Gen Xer, we started the trend, maybe, of course I moved back at home. Uh, to be my parents, because we were trying to make a music business, the radio, there's no money. And uh, of course, they stayed in public radio, there's no money in public radio. So, of course, I had a lot of jobs, bartender and wavering, all those things. But the gentleman I got involved with in my hometown to serve this little studio, we began doing music production, concert production, and we managed a few local artists. And this was really unique because another big influence on me my musical taste in getting into radio besides the Grateful Dead, and maybe move to the next slideshow. Um, well, actually, just to go back to radio for a sec. I, I, I'm sorry, you can go to the next slideshow. One of the big influences when I was in high school was the New York broadcaster, WNEW 102.7, Scott Muni. Uh, he died, yeah, I remember, he was famous uh, during the blackout in 1977. He had John Lennon on the air. So I would hear Scott Muni in New Jersey as a kid, and uh, Scott's so weird, WNEW. 102.7. And of course, he was the voice for a lot of commercials and a lot of, he was a great New York disc jockey. And as you, and also he was at WABC uh, in the 60s, he's one of the good old guys. Oh, and by the way, on a quick side note, cousin Brucey is still alive. <laughs> and, no, no joke. And, and as we'll get to it in a little bit, I still, I now work in satellite radio on Sirius X, and we'll jump to that. But I saw cousin Brucey the other day in the hallway. And it's fascinating because, uh, I mean, he's outlived all of these, these 60s disc jockeys, you know? And uh, so really, Scott Newton really was a big influence on me too, listening to him on WNEW in New Jersey as a kid. So yeah, I, I did want to share that. And we'll go to the next slide now. But interestingly enough, uh, what was a big influence on my life too, besides radio, was going to concerts. I loved concerts and events. So I was quite influenced by the famous uh, concert promoter of the late 60s up until the early 90s, Bill Graham. Now, Bill Graham, if any of you remember, ran the Fillmore East down on 2nd Avenue. Maybe some of you were there. Yes. Bill Graham uh, was a Holocaust survivor as a 12-year-old child. He left uh, Germany. And actually, he escaped with a bunch of children through Spain. And there were nuns' convents they hid out on the way through France and through 
uh, Germany and eventually ending up in Spain. And Bill ended up becoming adopted by a Jewish family who were taking in orphans from the war uh, in the Bronx. So he grew up as his name was Wolfgang Gang but That was you know, not English or American enough. So he changed it to Bill Graham. And he ended up being just in the right place at the right time. So he started, I guess, uh, in the late 60s, he worked up at the Catskills, and he was a waiter, and he was a real hustler. So he'd be up at uh, that famous place called uh, uh, Grossinger's, I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, okay, see, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Grossinger's, all right, good. See, you guys have been, you know what I'm talking about. So he would be one of the waiters in the big, in the big uh, ballroom, a uh, big yeah. dining room up there. And he talked about waiting on famous people, and he loved it, but I think Tito Puente came up, and he always loved salsa and the big band. Would have there, so he loved that whole energy. And what he would do is he'd run a crap game for the waiters and waitresses and the laundry workers back in like the bungalows where the staff work. So he was always hustling. But eventually, he moved out to San Francisco in the mid 60s and he got involved with a mime troupe out there. They were doing uh, concerts in the parks, and this is just as the summer of love and the hippie era was starting. And Bill got involved with all, and of course, the drug scene came in, unfortunately. Uh, but he was at the right place at the right time where he saw the power of public assembly. And he saw that uh, they could bring people together through music. So he started producing really what has become the modern concert. And at that time, there were all these bands like the Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, uh, Country Joan Fish, all these, these, these hippie bands really in San Francisco. But he saw the opportunity because he would talk to the musicians, who else should we bring? So what he was a part of, in a small way, was taking a lot of the artists that normally would not have played in front of rock and roll kids. So he would book Woody Herman, B.B. Uh, King, um, a lot of the blues artists, a lot of the artists from the um, folk boom of the 1960s in Greenwich Village. Uh, people like, um, uh, well, she was kind of part of Maria Moldauer, um, uh, old blues guys like Bo Diddley and Chuck Berry. So he would put them on with the hippie acts. And of course, that would be down to Phil Maurice. He had one in New York, and he had one in California, Phil Maurice, Phil West. And legendary concerts came out of here. And really, things, you would get in for $3.50, and you would see The Grateful Dead, you would see, uh, like, you know, Led Zeppelin, you see Miles Davis all on the same night. Really, it was, so he, in his story, and his involvement with all these musicians and producing concerts, really ended up uh, influencing me greatly, along with Scott Muni. So we can move to the next slideshow. So I had the opportunity then to start, uh, again, the high fructose curtains here haven't really kicked in yet. Uh, I started to get to work with musicians and find musicians that were older that had not connected to a lot of the artists who were of my generation. So uh, case in point, these two gentlemen, uh, and actually, it's funny, I have a little Bill Graham shirt on there, believe it or not. I got that when I was out of his foundation uh, out, out in 2002. So these two gentlemen I'm with here, I met, uh, they were uh, session musicians for Atlantic Records here in New York. Uh, to the left is a very famous bass player by the name of Jerry Jamon. And to the right of me, or to the right of you, is a very famous guitar player by the name of Cornell Dupree. So these two gentlemen were part of the great Atlantic records uh, legendary time frame of late mid-1960s up to the early 70s. So the two of these gentlemen played on countless hits that you would know. So for instance, Jerry, the bass player, uh, Jerry Jamon, he's from, he was born in the Bronx. Uh, he played on um, Aretha Franklin, many of the Aretha Franklin hits like Think, You Better Think, You Better Think What You're Trying to Do Me, Chain of Fools, Chain, 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 Chain of Fools. He played also on B.B. Um, King's The Thrill Is Gone. Uh, he played on, you remember the Rascals, People Gotta Be Free, all over the world, people just gotta be free, ba 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 He played on that, so these guys were on, uh, uh, and uh, Cornell Dupree played on, you remember, Rainy Night in Georgia, or um, a lot of Aretha's uh, Respect, da -da 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 -da. so these guys were all part of that. And of course, the younger generations of people didn't know about, or knew, the younger generations knew about them, but they didn't know they were still alive. So I began to find where these guys were still living in New York and playing out in small places and connect them. And it was really a neat way, and I looked into it as a way, being influenced by Bill Graham, uh, to, to put these artists together, to put the younger generation with the newer generation. And we got to do that a lot, and especially I did it through radio and producing small concerts, not huge ones like Bill did, 
But we had a small music festival in my hometown. I started uh, with this gentleman in that little studio. And then, of course, my continued radio work. OK, move to the next slide. Uh, so this uh, was Jerry again. Jerry was a dear, dear friend. He's out in Los Angeles now, but he was good friends with B.B. King. So we got to meet B.B. King, and I got to work with B.B. King several times in radio. And one of the neat things with B.B. King was um, uh, I got to do an interview about how he got to play for those young white audiences in San Francisco with Bill Graham. We did an interview just about that. Because when B.B. King wrote his biography, he talked about that was a huge change in his career. It was a pivotal time for him to um, be introduced to a whole new audience beyond the Chitlin circuit or the soul circuit down south. So uh, Jerry and I really, really had a great bond. We still do to this day. OK, we move on to the next slide. Um, also, one other group I got to work with quite uh, closely because of the gentleman, his name was Matt, um, and that little music festival we started with was uh, uh, Levon Helm of the band. If you remember the night they drove Old Dixie down with the weight up in the Woodstock era, they helped Bob Dylan go electric. And I actually, this is kind of cool, I'll stop and talk about the band and my work with them for a little bit. Um, I, uh, this was probably 2003, and Lee Bond was in Woodstock, and I would say that the late 1990s and early 2000s, a lot of these musicians were forgotten about. If they were alive today, I think they'd be playing the Beacon Theater for four nights, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because the younger generations, millennials, have really sucked into this good old American music, and they call it Americana music now. But Lee Vaughn, you might remember, he was also in Coal Miner's Daughter. He played Sissy Spacex's father. Uh, he was in The Right Stuff. So he also had some small bit parts as an actor. But interestingly enough, we got to work with him in 1997. And Bill Graham had famously gotten to present the very first shows of the band in Winterland, California, at, at a uh, ballroom out there, after they, they had done all the work with Bob Dylan. So full circle. You know, then getting to work with a lot of these artists that Bill worked with was quite meaningful to me. Or a lot of these artists that Scott Moody got to interview on WNEW and play. So I was definitely doing my own path, but it was just neat. I feel very grateful. It's funny, actually, putting this slideshow together for you all today brought back a lot of memories. And I'm looking at things a little bit, not full circle, hopefully I got a few more years. <laughs> just pray that I eat some more vegetables. But uh, that, uh, to see it, you know, kind of in one sitting. So this is a great joy for me on a side note. So um, uh, Levon, this is very interesting enough. I'll give you a, a sidebar story that kind of brings us to where we are today. He ended up getting diagnosed with throat cancer in 2000. And he ended up getting cared for his own cavity here across the street. And then uh, he lost his voice, but we continued to work with him when nobody else would because he was a great drummer and he had a blues band. So we would hire him for our festival to come down and his daughter, Amy Helm, would sing. She has a very good career of her own now. And uh, he ended up dying over here at Sloan Kettering. Uh, his anniversary of his death was just two days ago. It was April 20th, I think, 2012. And he died in ICU bed 20. I won't pass it off. And I'll give you a crazy quick story. It had gone out in the public in like late March, early April that my mom was dying. His throat cancer had returned. Oh, and by the way, his throat cancer had a hiatus, and he had the second wind of his career where he won Grammys, went on tour, basically from about 2005 up to about 2011. So he was given a second chance, if you will. And he had a big, big comeback uh, in his circles. That so anyway, um, I hear that he's dying. Then I remember, oh my gosh, he was at Sloan Kettering. I got a, I'm already a friar at this point. I got to call the friars and say, hey, listen, can you go see this gentleman? So of course, most of the friars don't know who these people are. I call, I call one of my friars up here. And I say, hey, listen, I got a favor to ask you. There's a musician I know him and his daughter uh, pretty well. And maybe you could drop by if you can find out where he is. And he goes, OK, what's the name? I said, leave on now. And he starts laughing. I am laughing. He goes, well, yesterday I was rounding to an ICU, which we do pretty much every day. Uh, and a young woman came up to me and said, my phone is not Catholic, but I think it would mean a lot if you could have a prayer and a blessing. So the friar went in. And it turned out it was Amy, Levon's daughter, who had brought Levon, or brought the friar in, the priest, to give him a blessing. And I think they said a song. And uh, so it was so funny how, how this little tiny worlds get connected. And her and I have become even deeper friends since the death of the father. So um, that was a great honor to 
work with me. I ended up working with other musicians in the band, Rick Danko, and also the other keyboard player, Garth Hudson. So it was a great honor to work with them. It was the Grateful Dead, the band, all these people who were connected to Bob Dylan. So we'll move on to the next slide show. Slide. Again, these are more the musicians, uh, getting to work with some of the younger musicians in the Beacon Theater from the Allman Brothers Band uh, that we're sitting in with. And I got to bring, you know, just great to bring worlds together. You know, it was never about the money, but just bringing people together. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. So this was my last gig. Very interesting. Now I'm kind of moving to how I'm becoming a friar. Uh, in Okay, in, uh, well, first of all, this photo was taken in Long Beach, California in uh, September of 2007. And in September of 2006, I received a phone call from a friend of mine who uh, had um, managed a radio station in Los Angeles called K-Jazz, biggest jazz and blues station out of Cal State University System of Long Beach. And she said, listen, my blues is jockey because that was my specialty. Uh, is going away for the weekend, or for a couple of weeks. Could you produce broadcasts in New Jersey with that X amount to me on CDs to California? So I said, no problem. I'd still been affiliated with that other station. They allowed me to use their studios. So I FedEx the discs out. And the audience had no clue for those weeks that I was some guy in a studio in New Jersey. So I couldn't talk about time. I never even talked about the weather in California. Oh, well, it's going to be sunny in 72 again. You know? <laughs> so I never talked about traffic or you know, LA politics. I just kept it to the just the facts, man, you know, if you will. But um, it was a great opportunity because it was the number one market, LA. I had done my time in radio in Boston with Emerson and then did my time in Jersey with a community station. But now I get the opportunity to be on a big LA market. And the signal went from Santa Barbara down to San Diego. We had huge coverage. So I said yes to the gig. I think it was only going to be three or four weeks. And then the, the, the DJ who I 